In this episode, I'll talk about eclairs and what they taught me about accelerated learning. So here we go, episode 74, Accelerate Your Learning. Hi, I'm Karen Rolfe, and welcome to Horse Training in Harmony. This podcast is about you making progress with your horse in a way that you both can love. It's about learning how to move and be in harmony. Because yes, you really can develop a horse to be both athletic and happy. When we show up as our best selves for our horses, our horses will show up for us. So let's get started. Now in this past year, I have become totally hooked on the great British baking show on Netflix. (laughs) Now it kind of makes sense because I love cakes and cookies and especially pastries. But (laughs) that's not the biggest reason that I actually like that show. I mean, that show is, it's a sweet show on so many levels. The humor is goofy and clean. And there's, there's a spirit of camaraderie, even though it's a competition. And there's people on the show whose role it is just to support the bakers and keep the energy really lighthearted. And the show's about learning, right? So they, the bakers come in there and they're all doing stuff. They're getting feedback and then they're doing it again. So I guess with all the crazy things going on in the world right now. I just find the Great British Baking Show a breath of fresh air. But (laughs) there's only so much I can watch other people make pastries without really wanting to have a pastry. (laughs) So eventually I found myself wanting to do it, right? So I'm like, I want to make a pastry. Now, this is a a strange thing for me to say because I am not a kitchen person. I actually have a sign in my kitchen that says, I understand the concept of cooking and cleaning, but not as it applies to me. So I'm watching the show. I'm getting all these cravings for pastries. This is out of watching. I think I binge watched, I don't know, like, eight seasons where I'm literally watching an episode every day. So total immersion (laughs) in the great British baking show. And I decided that I wanted to make shoe pastry and creme pat, creme patisserie. Uh, And so I, I thought, you know, think eclairs. That's what eclairs are. And I thought, all right, those look really good. They seem to be presenting people with you know, a fair amount of issues. So they kind of looked interesting and they weren't too sugary, right? They're more pastry rather than like cake or cookies. So I thought, I want to know how to make creme pat and I want to know how to make shoe pastry. (laughs) Now, the thing that I always knew about baking is it involves measuring. It involves some preparation. You know, you got to like chill the butter, (laughs) And, you know, there's timing involved. And these are all details that I am not great at, except when it comes to horses. Then measuring and prior preparation and planning, I'm really good at. So I think it was episode 64 of this podcast where I described how uh, my husband Dana is the details and the prep person. And I typically am just the person that wants to jump in, (laughs) jump in for the fun part. (laughs) Let's go. Uh, So, but I know jumping in and just like doing stuff is not a great plan for success in baking, especially with baking pastries. Nonetheless, I found a recipe and I decided to go for it. And then a funny thing happened. It went really well, like really well. Not only did I make the recipe with no mistake, like without 
messing something up, like putting salt instead of sugar or something like that. You know, so it not only went well, but I actually, I felt comfortable. And I realized I was feeling that it, it, it almost felt familiar. And that was strange. I found myself making decisions kind of as if I had experience with this, even though I didn't. I found, you know, the, the blog I found about these recipes, you know how these go. It's like there's all these stories and pictures and tips and, you know, stuff in the top. And then you got to like scroll all the way down for the ingredients and the actual like bullet point list. Well, I found myself zipping down to the ingredients and the bullet point list and not even feeling like I needed to read all the story above. Now you could say that's because I don't like preparation, but it actually was because I felt like I kind of had seen all that before from watching the show. So I, (laughs) I asked myself this question of could binge watching the great British baking show really make my skills better, better than, you know, or at least the same as if I had practiced it a whole bunch of times myself. I thought that was interesting, (laughs) you know, as a, as an educator. So I thought about it and I did some Googling and I came up with some really interesting information about this kind of learning. And I'll post the links to a couple articles in the show notes. If you're viewing this um, in a place where they have the show notes, or you can always go to my website and find it there. Just scroll, find the episode page and scroll down and you'll get to the notes. So what I've, I found is that scientists have discovered that people are good at learning about, about the best choices to make. However, we learn even better if we can also watch other people learning the same thing. So when we watch other people's choices, whether the results are good or bad, we end up with extra information on what the best choice may be. And then we can use that extra information to improve our own choices. So we do benefit from learning from others as it helps us make better choices ourselves, but not just learning from others by having someone else explain it to us, but learning from others by just watching other people learn. And it makes learning from other people's mistakes and successes more efficient than figuring things out on our own. And this made so much sense to me. I mean, this is what I experienced. You know, in the Great British Baking Show, it's all about fairly normal people. You know, yeah, they're good enough bakers. They were selected to, had to pass some sort of standard to get on the show. But it was really about fairly normal amateur bakers learning to do this skill on a, you know, bake it to a more professional standard. So raising the standard. And because of that, they're in there having to make lots of decisions through these challenges and they're making lots of mistakes. And it's the mistakes that kind of make the show fun, right? And it's why they need all the support people around to like keep people from melting down. But it gives us this great opportunity to observe this. Now, the other thing that I learned in in Googling, I'm not going to say researching this, but by Googling and reading lots of different articles, um, is that it, it helps to know the skill level of the person that you're watching beforehand. So I guess this, this kind of makes sense. If you're shown a video or you're watching someone, do a skill that you're not really familiar with, then, you know, if you don't, if you you might think it's an expert and be like, Ooh, let me look at everything that they're doing, but it might be someone who's not going to get a good result. And you're not going to know it's not a good result until the end, right? So you're watching everything they're doing. You're like, Ooh, let me write that down. Let me take notes. Oh, they did this and this. And then it's not till, you know, hour later that you're like, Oh, well that didn't work. (laughs) Now I have to go back and erase my notes. The same way is if you're watching somebody and you're thinking, oh, this person doesn't know what they're doing, but maybe they do. 
maybe they have a little bit of a unorthodox process or a process that you're not used to seeing. And so the process might put you off. You might see someone do something and they're like, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> you should never, I get this a lot with horses. You should never mount a horse from the right side. And if someone saw me mount a horse from the right side, they might not look at anything else that I do. Because in their mind, that's what a beginner does. <laughs> that's what someone who doesn't know anything about horses d does. So if we don't, if we haven't done a little bit of information gathering ahead of time, we might think, oh, that person doesn't know what they're doing. And we're going to be, when we think someone doesn't know what they're doing, we might, number one, not even bother watching. Or number two, we're going to observe that person with that preconceived idea in mind, and we're going to be only looking for mistakes. Even if you don't consciously think you're doing it, even if you didn't sit down and say, I'm going to make a list of all the mistakes they make. If your brain thinks that they don't know what they're doing, your brain is going to automatically start cataloging, cataloging all the things that they're doing wrong. Trouble is, if you don't know the outcome yet, you could be wrong because maybe those things are leading to the result. So knowing the skill level of the person that you're observing beforehand can really help. It gives your brain context and a way to, um, it, it kind of sets your brain up to be able to analyze and understand what it is you're seeing. But there's another interesting thing that I came across in um, multiple articles, which is this idea that watching an expert can actually give a false sense of improvement. And there's been uh, several studies that I came across pretty easily on this where they'd set somebody up, they'd have them watch videos and then <clears throat> ask them, you know, how confident do you feel about being able to do this? And then they set the people out to go do the thing. And then other people, they would have them watch the um, expert and then at the same time or immediately after be practicing it and they would assess their, um, you know, they would ask them to critique or assess their own confidence and abilities and the skills and then test them. And what they found was that people who watched an expert but didn't actually practice it themselves could, would usually have an overinflated sense of uh, competence and confidence about their ability to do it. So if you watch experts do stuff, they make it look easy. <laughs> and so your brain kind of goes, oh, that's easy. That's easy to do. That's easy to do. But the trouble is, you know, physical skills take practice. And to think that you're going to go from zero to easy, you know, easy success is really impossible. So it's a useless thing to, to tell your brain to do. Now, there is such a thing as visualization and I, and visualization absolutely does work, but I think there's a difference between passively observing an expert do something perfectly and easily, and then thinking you're going to be able to do it just because you watched it. There's a difference between that and active visualization because visualization actually takes a bit of effort. There's a couple kinds of visualization. There's the part where you're watching yourself do the thing as if you're watching a movie. And then there's visualization where you're actually seeing yourself do the thing from the perspective of yourself doing the thing when you do do the thing. <laughs> so for example, if you're visualizing um, yourself doing something with your horse, uh, one way is to visual visualize... <laughs> darn it, visualize yourself doing it and you'll see yourself like you're watching yourself on video. And in the other form, you're seeing yourself where you see the view of your horse's neck or ears as if you're actually riding them. And of course, the visualization where you're in the same perspective as you would be when you're doing it is more powerful. It takes a little bit of brain power. I've tried that and it's hard. I find myself flipping uh, back into the video mode. I find whenever I try to visualize myself riding a test, like I'm down center line, 
I can see my horse's ears, I can visualize it. And then it's when I turn the corner, I have trouble maintaining that. And I, I kind of pop out, I see myself turn the corner and then I get back <laughs> in it again. So maybe you guys are better at that than I am. So we need to watch things done well. I think that is powerful. I think it's it's powerful to watch someone do something well in order to get the visualization, to know what you're trying to visualize. But we have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of thinking that just because we've watched it that many times that we actually know how to do it. So watching experts improves confidence, but not necessarily skills. And I think we've all experienced meeting and what are they, an armchair critic, <laughs> right? An armchair critic is somebody who has watched all the lessons, who's watched all the videos, they know all the terminology, they've seen everything, and they can't actually do it themselves. But boy, do they have opinions on, on everybody else. So we want to be careful that we're not doing that. It's, it's important to get the visualization, get the picture, but then there's another layer. And uh, something that the article articles also said is in this case of watching the expert reading and thinking about something at the same time you're watching or, you know, not the same time, but read about it, think about it, then watch the expert, then read a little more, think a little more, then watch the expert, that that alone can uh, decrease the risk of overinflating your abilities. And one notch even better than that is to watch the expert and then read and think about it and practice it. Watch and practice, watch and practice, watch and practice, because then you will experience the gap <laughs> between what you're watching and what you're doing. And then you'll think about it differently. You'll watch it more closely for more specific details. And what they said to even fine tune that more uh, the watching and practicing part, they said it helped the most if you've tried it before watching. And, you know, I don't think it'd hurt to watch the video and then try it and then watch it again, but it's that second watching. It's the watching after you've experienced it, because then you're already going to know what you can do and what you can't do and what you were confused about and which was the part you needed help with. And even without thinking about it, if you experience it and then watch it, your brain is going to know. <laughs> your brain is going to know what to look for because it, it has had that experience. Another term that I came across, which I found super interesting, was called intuition flooding. And they're saying you can, you can develop a, a deep kind of understanding and an intuitive grasp for a topic by using what's called intuition flooding. And this is where you find a large number of examples of something you want to understand. They said like 20 to 100. <laughs> and you look at each of them really carefully, one by one, scrutinize them, and maybe jotting down interesting observations that you have or patterns that you notice. And there's an article about this that I'll link to in the show notes. Uh, so, and that makes sense, right? So you're just flooding yourself. You're giving yourself multiple samples of other people doing this thing that you're trying to do and you're thinking about it, you're scrutinizing it, you're actively learning and noticing from it. So I'd never heard that term, but it's kind of like, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. And it makes sense. But I think a lot of, a lot of us out there or a lot, of, you know, out there with our horses or, you know, sometimes we're struggling, we're just doing it by ourselves or we're taking lessons with one trainer or we, we ride alone or maybe it was one or two always of the same people. And we don't get that large sample size. So intuition flooding, and I think just by seeing it again, thinking about it, being infused with it, 20 to 100, looking at each one of them carefully. So something to think about it. And that made me think about other times when I've had 
you know, more accelerated learning or what in the horse world has given me this intuition flooding. And it's definitely when I was a working student. So I was a working student at a big facility um, back in my younger days. <laughs> and I thought about how much I knew I was learning at the time. I was, I was actively learning, right? I was with my, my instructor and trainer. I was thrilled to be there. I was asking questions. I was soaking up as much as I can and I was taking lessons. So there was a lot of active learning. I want to know this thing. Someone tells me about the thing. I practice the thing and I get feedback on the thing, right? It's sort of normal. But then I thought about all the situations and all the moments I was surrounded by. So I wouldn't have said that I was being taught them, but I was definitely flooded with them. I was definitely absorbing them just by being in that environment. It was a large facility. There were like 80 horses there. Lots and lots of students, lots of instructors. It was a great place to learn. And I got a chance to observe many, many people making decisions, doing stuff, and then seeing the outcomes, good or bad. Outcomes I wanted, outcomes I didn't want. Outcomes they wanted and outcomes they didn't want. And all soaking in just by walking by, just by being in that space. So that really made me think about the intuition flooding. So I think it is a combination of the active, purposeful learning and also just immersing and being around a situation where you're seeing process. And I think that's what's really important. It's not just seeing the perfect stuff. It's seeing the process. And then, of course, uh, all of this made me start thinking about, well, what am I offering for learning, right? So evaluating what I'm doing because I don't offer working student positions. And even if I did, it'd be, you know, one or two people of the whole world. <laughs> it's not enough. And I think in general, there's so many different kinds of learning opportunities for students out there. You know, back in my day, we didn't have the internet. <laughs> it was unusual if somebody had a video camera. So making you know, taking full advantage of those resources. And you can actually give yourself a, a chance to um, intuition flood, right? You can also find different ways to surround yourself with communities of people with similar goals. That's the key because <laughs> you get to see the benefit of other people's decision making and processes, their mistakes, their results. And this can really accelerate your progress um, I think, you know, it's most valuable if it's a group of people who share similar goals and principles because principles guide decision making. But like I said earlier, you can, you can also learn from seeing what doesn't work and, you know, what leads to results that you're trying to avoid. I think the key is to be really aware when you're in that situation. So there's many students that that work with me are in barns and they'll say something like, well, I'm the oddball, <laughs> you know, nobody else understands what I'm doing with my horse. And that's okay. Because remember, you're still learning a lot. You can learn, you can, if, you know, do the intuition flooding, uh, through the internet and then be conscious, look at the people around you and see what results they're getting. And if they're getting results that you don't want, it might be helpful to number one, be conscious of that. Like, Hey, there's a result I don't want. I wonder how they're getting that <laughs> you know? and approach it in a positive way. I think sometimes we want to just block it out. Like, I'm not going to look at that because I don't want to do that. Well, sometimes look at it because they are making decisions. You want to know what decisions they're making so you can know what you want to avoid and what you don't want to do. And I, I think this is really important because I think if you don't actively or purposefully tell your brain, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want that. It's going to, your brain is always learning. You're all, your brain is always connecting cause and effect and seeing patterns. It can't, it can't not do that. And especially if there's some people in your barn that are maybe credentialed or 
considered high up professionals, if you know that they have this sort of authority or this credential, even in the back of your mind, your brain is going to be saying, that's an important person. They're special. They're important. And that your brain's going to be connecting the dots and learning what they're doing. So, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm making people close minded, but just observe, observe what's happening, observe the cause and effect, let yourself enjoy the circumstance that you're in, but tell your brain what you want to be learning from this. And just know also that community can be found on the internet too, right? So Facebook groups, I know we all have a love hate relationship with Facebook, but I think the beauty of Facebook is in the groups if they're well curated groups, because that's where um, hopefully some of the trolls are weeded out. <laughs> I mean, I certainly try to do that in my groups. Uh, I'm very, um, very protective of the safe, positive learning environment. And so you really can create a certain community inside of groups. And I found some other groups and other interests that I have, believe it or not, I have other interests, not just horses and pastries. <laughs> and it has made all the difference in the world in how those groups are curated. So find your, find your people and be around them. Don't underestimate the power of just hearing the language and the thought process and the principles embodied and the images that people share and put yourself in those situations. It will accelerate your learning. And so when I thought about the intuition flooding, I thought about my video classroom and I thought, all right, you want to like scrutinize and study 20 to hundred examples of something. I'm feeling really happy because that's something that I've created. And, you know, now it has over 400 videos on different subjects. So definitely, definitely take advantage of something like that, right? That's what it's there for. And I was also feeling, um, super proud. I mean, I already know this stuff works, but um, I, so many, um, learning videos will show, um, what it's supposed to look like. They show the perfect process. And again, there's a place for that. You want to get uh, a source of positive visualization, but I, I've always wanted to put the process in there. I always wanted to show when stuff isn't working and show how to get from point A to point B and to show me coaching other students through that process. Because you don't want to just see the expert level. You're going to get a, that false confidence, right? We don't want the false confidence. We want to really help you with your decision making. This is also why um, when you're taking lessons to not just take a lesson and, and leave, but as much as you can observe other people taking lessons. Now there's lots of different clinic formats that you can do. The last 10 years, I've been really uh, focused on a, gr a group lesson, a group clinic format, which is everybody shows up in the morning. We all go through the whole day together. And at the end of the day, we all finish it up together. And I know that requires a higher degree of energy and time <laughs> and focus, power, and attent you know, attentiveness, which can be a challenge. But what I found is that really did accelerate the learning because people observed and they, they, you know, the people in the chairs were riding along with the people riding and asking questions in the moment and trying to put themselves in that place and seeing the cause and effect and how did, you know, and the decision-making on my part. Okay, I did this exercise with this person. Why did I do this exercise with the other person? And just immersing yourself, seeing those, those opportunities and scrutinizing them and thinking about them. It's also another reason why in like, for example, the finding the sweet spot of healthy biomechanics course, you know, I write about it in my book. There's some videos that come with the book, but I wanted to create a process where, um, people not only get the information, but we have these six month blocks of time where you get access to these live Q and a calls. So that's another opportunity to not only just ask your question, but a lot of times people 
will say, oh, this week I don't have a question. <laughs> oh, this month I don't have a question. And always try and encourage people to show up for those calls, whether or not you actually have your own question, because it's, it's this other opportunity to immerse, to observe, to be a fly on the wall, watching and observing other people's questions, other people's stories, other people's, you know, explaining the cause and effect of what's happening, seeing my decision making, how do I explain the answer? And then we can have follow up too. So um, for anybody who's in my courses, and you're not taking full advantage of those Q&A calls, like think of it in that way. It's not just an opportunity in case you might have a question. It's an opportunity to show up and um, flood your intuition. Because just like me with the great British baking show, just by watching and watching and watching and seeing mistakes, seeing other people make mistakes and seeing other people get feedback and seeing other people improve as the weeks and episodes went on. In that way, I was going through the process with them. Now I wasn't even live, right? So I'm just, I'm just watching. And I'm, I didn't even think I was trying to learn. That's the funny part. When I'm watching that show, I wasn't trying to learn. I would just wanted something sweet and silly and lighthearted to just kind of decompress and put a smile on my face. That's what I was trying to do. And I accidentally ended up learning. So imagine if you put a little effort into it. So look at what opportunities you might have in your life and your situation to try to immerse in the same way. That's the other reason, uh, the other a circumstance that I have set up for this is when I um, have my mastermind and mentorship program for professionals. So I do a two-day seminar. There's a ton of information in that seminar. You can take that information and run with it for sure. But I also created a six-month mastermind. Now, six months is way more time necessary than to like deliver the information. But the whole point is to have touch points and keep people staying in the community long enough to drop into the principles, to see how I answer questions, to listen to other people's stories and what they're trying to do and their process and just be there. And that's why I always tell people like, you don't just show up. <laughs> that's all you have to do. Just show up, put yourself in a circumstance, a horsey, great British baking show. <laughs> right? That's what my sweet spot course is. That's what my video classroom is. That's what the mentorship and mastermind program is. It's the great British baking show. We try to keep it lighthearted. We try to keep it fun and it's an immersion. So when you give yourself the opportunity to observe other people doing the thing that you might want to do, it's going in whether or not you think so, whether or not you even want it to go in, it's going in. Now I got so excited by my success making eclairs that I decided to make some palmiers and they worked too. <laughs> the first time, my first time, they totally worked. Okay. They could have looked a little prettier, but they worked. And I found myself like problem solving along the way and thinking, Oh, I need to do this again from what was infused in me. And I, when they were done, I ran into the living room and I I showed one to Dane. I said, look, look at the lamination. <laughs> look at me using a term <laughs> for baking. Anyway, that's the kind of learning I want you guys to do. That's where you just immerse and you're enjoying the process and the right things are going in and you can get excited and you can surprise yourself by how you're learning. So let's sum up. <laughs> How to accelerate your learning. Immerse. Find a way to immerse. Immerse in observation. Immerse in community. Increase your exposure to what you are trying to learn. Most of all, increase your exposure to the process. Be able to observe people doing the process. Don't just watch the experts being experts. Watch people making mistakes. It's the decision-making process that you want to train your brain to notice. 
And when it notices, then it can do it. And remember to read and think about what you're trying to do and practice it so you can feel it. Try something and then watch a video again or watch someone else doing it. Try it, watch it, try it and watch it. For me, it was eclairs and palmiers. Maybe for it to you, it'll be transitions and shoulder ins and half passes. <laughs> Good luck out there. Let me know how it goes. 